right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeline or CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined uh, from Auckland, New Zealand, welcoming from the future, Elias Canaris. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm Thank absolutely you. fantastic, John. Pleased to be here and thank you for hosting me on your show. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and uh, Elias is the author of Leading from the Stop, Positive Influence and Heartfelt Resilience in a Time of Adversity. And this is a fascinating story. So basically, um, I mean, let's let's get straight into it. Why don't you just give the background uh, background to the book and your experience, which is quite quite an amazing one. Absolutely. Well, John, it was an ordinary Tuesday. I was at my parents' house in Wimbledon in South London, uh, mm -hmm. about to take a trip from London Heathrow to Chicago uh, when I suddenly realized I had a wardrobe malfunction. Um, actually, well, I failed to pack a tie. Now you'd say that's uh, not really a wardrobe malfunction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, was, I was traveling business class during a time when you had to dress up for the part. In fact, um, I ended up going to the airport. I was flying from London Heathrow to Chicago. And halfway through the flight, uh, the pilot came on to say, ladies and gentlemen, let, I, let me first reassure you, there's nothing wrong with the airplane. However, there has been a significant incident. And as a result of this, um, Federal Aviation Authority has shut down all airspace. And we became one of 38 airplanes that was diverted to Ganda International Airport, Newfoundland, Canada, where we end up spending a further five days as uh, guests of the Salvation Army. So not exactly what I expected. That day just happened to be September 11, 2001. Mm. Yeah, and um, and to be honest, uh, I you've have you seen the the play, the musical Far and Away? Yeah, Absolutely. I, I, so I, I I saw that in Dublin uh, a number of years ago, back when I was back home one Christmas. So. It is exactly the story that uh, my book covers because I was one of those plain people. Um, the, the the town of Gander woke up that morning, uh, nine thousand three hundred for breakfast. By the time 38 airplanes had landed, they ended up serving 16,000 for supper. How, how, how do you do that? How do you cope with that? Where is the, where's the emergency plan that says, hey, you know, uh, add another 6,000 odd people, almost 7,000 people to your, your population uh, in an instant? And what we saw, what we observed was all about leadership and resilience as the local people in Newfoundland, Canada, came together to look after us, to take care of us, and to make sure that we could survive this traumatic experience. Yeah, and, it, and it's fascinating, isn't it, that uh, a small community, you know, kind of, I think that international airport was, I don't know, it, it didn't get that much traffic anymore. It used to once upon a time, and then long haul flights and stuff bypassed it. So it was kind of place forgotten in time not the place where you would expect people to be fantastic at crisis management. And I think maybe that completely changes our perspectives a little bit. Look, for, for sure it does, because you're right, John, the, the, the airport had been abandoned for a long time. As you rightly point out, it used to be a stopover point between Europe and North America, Canada. But uh, jet airlines uh, meant you could fly further distance, so it got bypassed. Now, the interesting situation is that when you look at this, you had a whole lot of people who suddenly arrived at their doorstep, people who were who were lost, who were broken, who were in pain. And we didn't know that at the time because nobody actually understood. This was pre-social uh, media, pre-smartphones, mm -hmm. pre-Wi-Fi on an airplane. So all we had was what Captain Mike Ballard told us and then what we heard through the BBC World Service to then give us a bit of an update in terms of the actual events in New York City and Washington, D.C. But when you find people who are lost, who are broken, who are in pain, you've got to understand that you have to be there to help them. And everybody's going through a different shift at that stage. And you've just got to be there to, to work through. What can I say? Salvation Army, the rest of the team really, really uh, is working well. Yeah, so obviously one of the key things in all of that is is empathy, right? Is the genuine empathy because 
Well, yes, face it. I mean, if you're if you're one of the locals, you can you can react in one of a number of ways. You can go, oh my goodness, this is terrible. All these people have come here. We don't know what to do. Or you know, or you can you can step up to it. But it, I guess empathy. You you must have seen such fantastic examples of empathy because we hear empathy talked about all the time now. Authenticity, empathy, um. But I don't think sometimes people recognize it in its truest form. I, I have a slightly different phrase for what I uh, yeah. observe as empathy. And, and that phrase is walk slowly through the crowd. Uh, and I saw this demonstrated by uh, Teresa uh, Antoinetti, uh, who was the secretary of the Salvation Army. She literally arrived at the Salvation Army. So we were 24 hours stuck in the aeroplane before they allowed us to disembark because they had to, number one, set up uh, security and number two, set up immigration. Uh, and then once they processed us 24 hours after we'd landed, we were bust the 40 minutes of Salvation Army. Teresa was at the uh, front door saying welcome to all 198 passengers as we streamed into what was going to become our home for the next four days. The interesting situation for us is, number one, there's empathy just in the fact that you're welcoming people. One of my fellow passengers said, what, what was she doing? What was she saying? And then he said, he realized she was saying, welcome, literally. And, and the second thing is that she then started to just walk amongst everybody, just having little chats here and there. And notice a couple who were um, in quite a, a state of trauma, I guess. Uh, their son uh, had just had an accident in Indonesia and he had an infection in his leg, which could have meant the end of his career uh, as a professional surfer. Trouble was they were stuck in Gambo in Newfoundland. Their son was in Indonesia. They had to figure out how to get him over and back safely to Australia where he could get the medical attention he desired. She turned around and said, look, use my office. Here's my personal cell phone. Just go for it. Just do what you need to do. How many people would have the presence of mind to do that, especially back then, when it probably cost you um, half a mortgage <laughs> to make a phone call on, on a mobile device? But she said, just go for it. Yeah, you, you know what I find interesting and fascinating about this is sometimes when there's a crisis and the people who are in charge, if you like, uh, they can react in multiple different ways. As you said, like some people are very good at this and some people are. Some people end up treating the people that they're looking after sort of like children, right? You know, barking orders at them and trying to get that. And they think they're doing the right thing because, you know, they're trying to bring order, order to chaos. And that's kind of maybe their reference point. But that's not what that's not what people need in a, in a situation like that. They don't need to be like barked at or treated like children. They need to be treated like adults, like individuals, like human beings. Look, absolutely. We, we have to relook at the paradigm. First of all, let's take a, a crisis. A crisis quite often involves change. And whenever there's change, you require transition. Now, people are very happy usually with the start state or the end state of a transition. But it's that little change, that trans transition between that's difficult for a lot of people. So if you think about this, um, I don't know, last time uh, you went to the um, to the circus, you know, probably a long time ago, you might have seen a trapeze artist holding onto the bar, swinging from one side to the other, where eventually they're going to let go of one set of bars and grab a second set. But in between that, they are doing a little bit of flying and they're asking themselves one simple question. Can I make it? And I think for us uh, in a situation like that, we've got to ask ourselves, can I make it? So one of the first things that I learned is that, number one, you've got to look after yourself first. It's good to ask for help. And I think we've, we've experienced this uh, with COVID uh, yep. recently. Uh, mental health is a massive, massive issue, especially mm. with people who are locked down, who are stuck at home, who don't have that community and ability to catch up together. So if look after yourself first is the first thing that we learn. The second thing is to build and expand your community because you've got to look after others. And I found that really fascinating that during lockdown, a good friend of mine, Bill, had a list of maybe a dozen or so people that he would call on a regular basis. So once a week, I'd get a phone call. 
And all he wanted mm -hmm. to, to do was say, hey, Elias, are you okay? Uh, how's it all going? How are you coping? And for me, it was a relief to have somebody who cared about me. I mean, okay, he sports Manchester United. I support Arsenal, so we don't have a lot oh, in common. Yeah, yeah, I support I support Arsenal too. So, um, poor guy. oh, thank goodness for that. We're, 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 we must be loyal people to continue supporting. Them. But if you if you think about this, look after yourself first, then build and expand your community. Well, the third thing is to change the rules, because mm. you know I found myself back then focused on the production of a report that was all-consuming for me to the point that I was ignoring everybody else around me. But it took a, a, a local congregant at about midnight on the first night we were at the Salvation Army who was there just to, you know, be available should somebody want to talk, sitting next to me doing her knitting, knit one, pearl one, started <laughs> chatting to me. And, and my first reaction was to be annoyed. Oh, yeah. don't interrupt me. Just, just let me get on with my work production focus. All she wanted to do was ask me questions. Uh, are you married? Do you have kids? Got out her, her little uh, a purse and there were the, the passport photos of her four grandkids. And then I realized, actually, Elias, this is about relationships. Leave the production to one side. Start focusing on people because we are, I'm going to use the C word, we're talking about community here. Yeah. Uh, COVID has stopped us from having community by separating us, by throwing us to work from home. But people seek that community because that's where relationships are born. Yeah, I'm, I I totally agree with you. And I think if there is one lesson that has come out of COVID is that how important how important community and connection is to people. I mean, we always knew it was important, but we didn't quite know in this modern world that we live in just quite how important it, it still was. And and I love that story that you just said about the uh, about the the, the congregant, the woman who who sat beside you and started talking to you because, yeah, we we can get very closed off and kind of consumed in our own in our own worlds. And I think we've seen, as you said, over the last couple of years, that, that, that that's not a healthy thing. And mental health is something that people still struggle with. Even um, not even the people who have it, it's even people around them like under, uh, struggle with, you know, understanding or coping with it. Look, uh, go back to what I, I think I said earlier on, uh, yeah. John. It's you've got people who are lost, who are broken, who are in pain and they surround us, all of us. And they could be uh, in our family, in our community, could be our co-workers, they could be our suppliers or our clients. What we have to do is understand that uh, it's all about relationships. And I go back to uh, an experience I had in the UK before I left the UK in the mid-90s to come and live in New Zealand. I used to work uh, for an IT company uh, developing a product known as the Personal Communication Computer, or the PCC for short. Now, what it was, was a desktop computer. We had a hardware card in there with some tailored software. We connected a, a camera to that. And beside the um, computer was a phone, an ICN phone line. And we had one at each end. And what we used to do is we used to use the PCC to communicate. A little window, video window appeared on the screen. We had a, um, a whiteboard. We'd annotate on that. And I said to my boss, I said, John, why don't I turn around and work out of our training offices? That's only about uh, four or five miles down the road from where I live, compared with going the 20 odd miles into London mm. to our headquarters. He said, Elias, I want you in the, in the office. I said, John, this is a collaboration tool. Yeah. I can do this, you know, be great testimony. But he said, Elias, in the office, when I finally realized, okay, <laughs> game's up, uh, let me go in. I said, John, why do you want me there? He said, Elias, all business is done either over a cup of coffee or around the water cooler. This is the early mid nineties. John, yeah, yeah. a real uh, a visionary back then was talking about relationship, talking about community, talking about us being together. That's what we're made for. And the biggest uh, difficulty is the, the PCC, which evolved to what we today know as Skype mm -hmm. is a product okay. that needs still to have that personal in in person touch and i think you've got to be careful to 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 recognize that we're in a difficult time with a virus that can potentially be very deadly but you've got to be in a situation where you do not um 
extract that human connection from our lifestyle because I think that would be the biggest travesty of COVID. Yeah, I, 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 I totally, I totally agree with you. And I think that's a great lesson learned from it is that whole need for community. Let me ask you this. Were there people when you when you were in Newfoundland among that, were there people who in the initial maybe hours or days, like, you know, kind of completely shut down or, or kind of cut themselves off from what was going on and needed to be kind of brought into the community? Well, I think we, we had uh, a number of different things that happened. Remember, there were 38 aeroplanes, uh, yeah. nearly uh, six or 7,000 uh, plane people who were stranded there. Uh, our, our plane happened to be quite a social plane. And by that, what I mean is, number one, uh, Captain Mike Ballard and the crew had set a scene for us to make us feel safe. Uh, his opening comment about the fact that the plane was, was not... Um, uh, you know, nothing wrong with the aeroplane, but we had to divert, uh, framed it well for us. So most of us were then able for that uh, 24 hours we were on the tarmac to talk to each other. So normally you'd sit there in business class or first class or a zoo, and that's where you'd stay. But I found myself traveling through from business class to uh, the back of the plane, talking to people and w walking through with them. One or two of the people that I met were in denial. And they probably could not, you know, comprehend how this could have happened. And yes, we had to bring them on board once we finally figured out the, the true story. Uh, but there are other planes where uh, there was a lot more panic. We didn't see that on our particular plane. But I think that was the framing that, as I said, Captain Mike gave us effectively. In his, in his opening statement, he was saying, here are three things. Number one, you're not in trouble. Number two, I believe in you. And number three, we're here to help. And I think this is so important that we use that same framing to take somebody who is disengaged, who is frightened, and help them to transition over and be part of the team. Yeah, and and I think obviously the the people who did that during COVID, I think the the companies and the leaders who did that well during COVID, who who understood that people were worried people felt isolated maybe people were some people were maybe home on their own you know they maybe they used work as maybe work was their social outlet and now suddenly they're home in a in a one bedroom or studio apartment and staring at the wall uh so i think it's i think the people who really show great leadership skills are the ones who recognize that they needed to even over communicate uh, during that but communicate in a very personal way and also you know Again, back to the empathy is like emp empathize with people who were maybe struggling. Look, I think you're right. You, you do have to empathize. And I'm so glad that you said that, John, because you, you cannot, in my humble opinion, over communicate. I think it's one of the most important uh, uh, tools in our arsenal, especially if you want to build trust with your community. So those that communicated and over communicated did a great job. Uh, we've all heard recently of, of, of a situation with a um, uh, an organization in the UK uh, that ended up um, effectively dismissing their whole staff through a, a video call, through a Zoom call. I mean, really, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine. Um, but, you know, can we over communicate? I don't think so. But I think it's important to make sure that you, you go back to your core values. Are you going to align your communication message with your core values? And how can you then ensure that that gets buy-in from your people? Because people can see right through uh, all the BS if it if it exists. Yeah, no, and that that's a that's a great example because unfortunately, I haven't been in the position in the past where I've had to downsize. And you know, the worst thing is when you have to um, let people go not because of performance, but purely on you know for economic reasons. I mean, it's incumbent on you as a leader is to sit down, look them in the eye, and 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 do it in 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 the most charitable way that you possibly can while still executing what you need to do. Look, for sure. And I, and I think that uh, it comes back to your, your point about empathy in the first place. I, I, I link empathy with trust. And I think uh, people get to buy from you and they get to know, like and trust you. But to build trust it takes time. You can't expect somebody to just say, hey, I'm going to come through. But if you're inconsistent in your communication, people start to doubt you. 
They, they analyze everything that you do, that you say. And today with a, um, with, with a world that you're on 24 seven, social media is there tracking you. Be careful mm -hmm. what you say, what you post, because somebody is watching. In fact, a friend uh, of mine was telling his teenage son, he said, you know, just to let you know uh, that, that um, the, the difference between love and Facebook is that one of them lasts forever. Yeah, that's great. Great. That, I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and we know which one it isn't. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> generally, generally speaking. <laughs> well, this, this, this is, a, Elias, this has been fantastic. Um, just to remind of you again, the book is Leading from the Stop, Positive Influence and Heartfelt, Heartfelt Resilience in the Time of Adversity. I would really encourage people to go check out, check out the book. And um and then all of the Elias, uh, Elias is information will be below the video here. But before we go, please do tell us a little bit more about what you do these days. Oh, well, these days I'm back into the, the whole aspect of training on leadership and resilience. And I really love the opportunity to uh, help organizations transition into that time of crisis and say, how do we continue? Because after 9-11, we thought it all stopped, but we got through. And even if it was not 9-11, global financial crisis, COVID, we can work our way through. So I'm all about getting this message of uh, leading from the stop back out to the wider audience. Yeah, and I think it's fantastic because, I mean, uh, like we saw with COVID, was a completely novel and new experience. When you had that experience with um, on 9-11, it was a completely novel a new experience. So in many ways, you're more qualified than most people to deal with uh, <laughs> to deal with unexpected crises. So I would uh, I would highly encourage people to go check it out. And by the way, if you get a chance to see the musical Far and Away, I think that's the correct name, isn't it? Um, come, come from away. Yeah, come from away. Okay, yeah, come from away. Far and away with some awful movie that tom cruise made in ireland that was <laughs> yeah we come from away yeah but absolutely check it out great musical all right well um listen this has been fantastic thank you so much for for talking with us today and thank you for listening and i'll see you all again soon thank you thanks for having me